theory topics. Ukraine. This is a map of the Russian space. It is on its side, so feel free to tilt. On the right, we have a population density map. And if you look at that lighter color of orange going from Central Europe down into Central Siberia, that lighter color of orange is roughly the population density of Nebraska if you remove Lincoln and Omaha. No. People do live there, but only just. The map on the left is a combined climate and economic map. Now, the green zone that roughly overlays populated Russia, that's the wheat belt. That's the part of Russia that is worth having. But you only get one crop of low-quality wheat a year. And so it's the lowest capital density of any agricultural zone in the world. As a result, Russian infrastructure is poor. They've never had the money to build a national road network. You're going to move anything, it has to be by train. You move to the right, to the north, to the blue. You're in tundra and tegai, and it's empty and it's worthless. Go to the left, to the yellow, to the south. You're in desert, also worthless and empty. But what drives the Russians to binge drink is the beige. Territories that even by Russian definitions are useless, but they're flat and they're empty, and you can sh totally shove a Mongol horde through there. Russia has been invaded 50-odd times in its history. And only once has the Russian army been the deciding factor in driving them back. It has always been the weather that's done the heavy lifting. So how do you defend a space like this? You go on the offensive. You expand out of the green through the beige until you reach a series of geographic barriers that you can use as bulwarks. And then you position your very slow-moving rail-supplied troops and the access points between those. You plug the gaps. And if you can do that, you shrink your external borders from more than 5,000 miles to less than 500. This is the plan. Has been for 400 years. Has been since 1992. Every international crisis in this region that has occurred since then has typically been Russian instigated and has ended with Russian troops in one of those gaps. They lost control of all but one of them at the end of the Cold War. They now have half of them back. If they secure Ukraine, they will then move on to where the two biggest of those gaps are, the two most consequential, and those are in Romania and Poland. They have not been shy about saying this. Now. This was our understanding of the Russian strategic picture before the war. Things have evolved a little bit since then, mostly because of what went down in the first month. You guys remember on the fourth day of the war when that 40-mile-long convoy of military vehicles started going south from Belarus to Kyiv, and that one convoy had more military firepower than the entirety of Ukraine's pre-war military? And I had been probably one of the more optimistic people for Ukraine, seeing that they've made a lot of gains in their military efficiency and their decision making and their equipment uh, since the first war in 2014. I was like, you know, they'll probably last six months to a year. And I was as optimistic as it got. And here I am on the fourth day of the war, and I'm like, well, I was wrong. This is going to be over by the weekend. And then on the seventh day of the war, that convoy stopped because the Russians forgot fuel trucks. And over the next three days, soldiers got out of their equipment and walked back to Belarus because they also forgot food. And there was this, this general flabbergasted feeling across the defense industries of the West as we realized that a lot of the assessments that we had all kind of assumed bedrocked our analysis were just wrong. The Russians don't have an army. They have a mob with guns, and that's something that's very different. And so, as we kind of repositioned and reassessed, we realized that if the Russians are successful in Ukraine, when they push up against Poland and Romania and the rest, they will come across NATO forces that are the experts in combined arms warfare, and the Russian forces will be obliterated. On a good day, they might hit, kill one NATO force for every thousand that they lose. But that made no one happy, because if there's anything we understand about how the Russians see the world, it's this. And if they can't possibly defeat NATO in a conventional conflict, but they've already paid the price for a major war with none of the benefits, then nukes will come into play the next day. 
And so the decision was made in Washington, in London, in Berlin, in Warsaw, even in Stockholm, in the first month of the war, that we had to prevent that occasion from occurring. And so the Ukrainians can have anything that they can prove that they can operate and maintain. The Germans were very, very specific on the whole maintenance thing, because like a weapon system you use once and then stop, that's not a weapon system, that's a paperweight. Operate and maintain. But they can have it. Everything else is a rounding error. There's a lot of rounding errors, there's a lot of details to work out. But that's the strategic assessment from the very beginning, because we know if we don't do this and the war reaches the NATO border, we will lose Atlanta and Detroit. It's just about the numbers. Now, that has any number of implications, no matter how you look at it. I think it's good to look at the raw material supply issue. This is central Siberia, in case anyone is looking for a summer home. It's permafrost. Now, you guys don't have a lot of that down here, but the concept is it's so cold year-round that you have a layer somewhere from a centimeter down to 10 feet, 30 feet, somewhere, where below that level it never thaws. And in the summer, the top layer melts, and oftentimes you get horizon-spanning swamps like this. These are thermal karst lakes. If you want to produce something mineral-wise in this sort of environment, you wait for it to freeze solid, you run a piece of infrastructure, typically a berm with a pipeline, a road, a rail line, out into the middle, thousands of miles long in some cases. You have your drilling platform, and you drill in the winter when it's all frozen. You can't drill in swamp. And then you ship it back. Now, this is a very expensive environment to work in. And so the Russians have the highest upfront development costs in the world. It's also a very dynamic landscape because you know it melts every year. And so let's say you have an aquifer that cracks open. Well, everything slides to the side. Or maybe the aquifer drains down, in which case you get a mother of a sinkhole. Or let's say you have a warmer than normal summer, and so the permafrost starts to melt. And then when it refreezes, water expands and the land bubbles. These are all really bad for infrastructure. So the Russians have the highest maintenance costs for mineral production in this region in the world as well. Problem for the Russians, their educational system collapsed in 1986, before the Soviet fall. Which means the youngest people in Russia who are worthy of the term engineer, they turned 64 this year. You think you have labor problems? <laughs> oh no. So for the last 15 years, the Russians haven't been the ones doing this work. They don't have this wor labor force for it anymore. It's been BP, it's been Exxon, and especially the Germans and the Dutch. And that all went to zero the day the Russians rolled into Ukraine. I can't tell you when this is all going to stop. Tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now, I just don't know. Too many moving pieces. But we need to prepare for a world where none of this stuff gets out. And that means the world's third largest support, supplier of oil, the largest supplier of nickel, the second largest supplier of natural gas, lithium, rare earths, you name it. It's all going away. That has implications for lots of folks. Green transition are, should be at the top of that list. But for purposes of this group, I just want to compare it to what it looks like on the other side of the world. Here's the upper Midwest. Any Midwest? Anyone from this map? Okay, so you guys know that the most important place, not just on this map, but in human history, is this city right here. Marshall, Marshalltown, Iowa, where I'm from. <laughs> here we have Bismarck, North Dakota. Should you find yourself in Bismarck, you're gonna have to ask yourself the deep, penetrating, soul-searching question, how did I let that happen? <laughs> and this is not a frat party. This is the back in oil shale, and it's lit up because of a problem with transport. Now, oil's a liquid, it conforms to the shape of a container, so you can put it into a rail car, or a tanker truck, whatever you want. But natural gas is a gas, it disperses. So you have to have a leak-free system to collect it, to transport it, and to use it at the same pace that it comes in, because storage is almost impossible. Now, here in the US, we have the world's largest and most diversified natural gas transport system, but we can't keep up with what is bubbling up out of the oil fields as a byproduct. And we can see it from space, the flaring. 
So here, only here, natural gas basically sells below market price. And so our natural gas prices consistently for the last 15 years have been a quarter or less the global average. It's a very different world. So if you've got the American system with a more stable labor market and one that will recover, and a more stable capital market and one that will recover, and the need to expand its industrial plant to have it local, the math is all there for a boom of just absolutely epic proportions. Now what that means is different based on who you are. So I think I'll close with this because I'm wildly over time already. If you're at the bottom of this, your supply chain will fit on the back of a cocktail napkin. If you're at the top, you have no idea who your third tier suppliers are, much less your 13th tier. If you're on the left, you're already within the NAFTA, I'm sorry. If you're on the right, you're already within the NAFTA network, and if you're on the left, you're dependent on mainland China. So a couple stakes in the ground. American workers, American production, American capital, American midstream, American processing, and primarily American consumption. Doesn't get much simpler. Doesn't get much more complicated. The iPhone has 1,100 supply chain steps. After four years of diversification efforts, Apple has reduced the percentage of those steps in mainland China from 92% to 91%. If you like the iPhone, whenever a new model comes out, buy an extra, because in the not too distant future, it's just gonna stop for a while, and they're gonna have to rebuild their supply chains on another continent, and that will take five years. All right, I'm gonna go through a few of these. Number one, if you're looking for something to stress out about, these are the four. If we don't get these right, nothing else can be attempted. So let's do these in order from positive to negative. First, material, I'm sorry, chemicals. That's the best news. Most chemicals are derived either from oil-based naphtha or ethylene that comes from natural gas. Because the United States has more natural gas than anyone else, and at a lower price point, we have seen the industry, without prompting, without any action from Congress or the administrations, basically expand our chemical footprint so that we are now the world's lowest cost, highest quality producer of all the base and intermediate materials. Which means we have all the inputs that we need to try everything else. No one else in the West or the advanced world has anything like that. Machinery. Think of it as the stuff that builds other stuff. The world's largest supplier of high quality machinery is Germany. The world's largest supplier of low quality machinery is China. The world's second largest in both of those categories is Houston. There's any number of reasons why Houston's gonna do well over the next 30 years. But whenever I see someone from Houston and an audience that's not in Houston, I get a little mad because they should be back home expanding their industrial plant. <laughs> they have to come first. Electrical steel. Let's put aside the green transition for a moment. If all we're going to do is increase the industrial plant, we need to increase generation and grid capacity by half. Now, electrical steel is not something we do much of because you usually only do it when you're electrifying for the first time. For us, that was in the 50s and early 60s. And then we steadily whittled it down to just maintenance needs. So we need 30 times as much electrical steel production as we have right now. Now, there's nothing about this that is really time consuming or expensive, but that's not the same as saying it's free and instantaneous. Materials processing, that's a China, China, China story. All that subsidization, producing anything that they can, even if they're not good at it, Low environmental regulations, it doesn't matter if it's steel, aluminum, lithium, anything. The Chinese control somewhere between 40 and 80% of all of it. And like electrical steel, there's nothing about this that has a magic mix. We know how to do it, we've known how to do it for the better part of a century for most of these things. But it still needs to be reshored, or the rest of this we can't try. You're gonna worry about something, worry about that. The reason the Asians excel at electronics manufacturing is they have a differentiated labor market. And I said Asians, not Chinese, Asians. The person who does the lenses is not the person who does the wiring or the coatings or the die cast or the software or the motherboard or the programming. All of those are different labor markets with different labor skill sets and different labor price points. 
The Asian rim going from Cambodia to Japan has 13 discrete labor markets based on quality and cost. We have two. Anglo-America, Mexico, that's it. If we pick up that model and drop it in here, the cost alone is gonna bankrupt us. How we maintain this, I don't know, but I can give you hope because of what happened with clothes. If you remember back to the pre-NAFTA days, states like Tennessee were big into textiles, and the model was women with sewing machines. And then NAFTA happened, and all those jobs picked up and went to Mexico, but the model stayed the same, women with sewing machines. And then the WTO happened, and those jobs picked up and moved to China and India, but the model was the same, women with sewing machines. And then COVID happened, and everybody shut down at the same time, and we had no clothes, and we are not Swedish, so going naked was never an option. We discovered that the model had changed in the last 50 years. And facilities were popping up in Western North Carolina that were two acres under one roof where you could bring in raw cotton, it would be cleaned, turned into thread, yarn, cloth, clothes, and the end product per garment cost less than what would come out of Bangladesh. And these facilities had a staff of two. Software engineer, mechanic, done. The model had shifted because technology had evolved, but we didn't know that until we were forced to try. We're gonna find a lot of things like that, I think, but we're not gonna find them until we look. Pre-Trump, roughly 70% of vehicles that were sold in the United States had 80% or more of their components made within the North American system. Courtesy of NAFTA II, we are now up to 85%. Doesn't sound like there's much of a margin until you realize that's almost a trillion dollars of parts just to get to 100. So even in a mature market, there's a lot of growth. All right, I'm gonna close with this part. Okay, so, oversimplifying, three general categories for semiconductors. You've got your dumb chips, 90 nanometer and bigger, almost analog. They can do one, maybe two things. This is your internet of things. You have your medium quality chips, 10 to 90. This is most of what we use. This is automotive, this is aerospace, this is power management, this is most phones that are not the iPhone. Then you got your high end, 10 nanometer and smaller. The iPhone, the newer smartphones, satellite communications, uh, electric vehicles, artificial intelligence, okay? The low end, 80% of that is from China. So if you want a singing margarita machine, the window is short. <laughs> the middle, I'm sorry, no, the high, let's do the high next. 90% of those chips come from one town in Taiwan. That's a lot worse than it sounds. Because the Taiwanese, who are no slackers, can't build or maintain these facilities by themselves. It's the pinnacle of manufacturing. It involves over 9,000 suppliers. Half of those suppliers only produce one product for one end user, and they have no competition anywhere in the world. Well, what that means is that if anything happens, deglobalization, the environment that allows this to function just stops and we won't be able to produce the high-end chips until such time as that environment is reconstructed somewhere else. That's a 10-year program. The middle. I don't worry about that one. There are 13 different countries that produce the mid-quality chips. China's one of them, we're one of them, Italy's one of them, Ireland's one of them, Israel's one of them, Korea, Taiwan, it's a long list. And more importantly, the supply chain system for it is very varied, using a lot of players from different continents with a lot of competition. So you could peel out entire continents from the world and we'd still be able to produce those chips at scale. So the low end, that's going away. The high end, that's going away for a while. We'll rebuild them with time. But what we use for most things, we're okay. All right, I had more, but I have already exhausted everyone's patience, so we can talk about the cartels another day. All right, whoops, back. 
All right, if you're looking for more, the newsletter and video log is the QR code on the left. It is free, I will never share your data with anyone, but if you happen to come across something, you're like, oh yeah, I would have totally paid for that, don't give the money to me, well, I mean, you can if you want to, but I prefer you give it to the, the QR code on the right, that is MedShare. They are a medical charity that I am supporting at the moment. They provide medical assistance to communities who through no fault of their own have lost the ability to help themselves. So for example, if the Russians start bombing your power grid, MedShare steps in with diesel generators and fuel and surgical kits for hospitals. This is the link specifically to the Ukraine page. Whew. How are we feeling? Thank you. Okay. I have been informed that there's a microphone in the back. So I will answer whatever questions you have. Please make them painful and awkward. It's better for everyone that way. Do you and want to come to come the mic. Come? come to the mic for your You have to go to the mic. Oh, I'll okay. bring it to you. Yeah, you yell because there's nobody at the mic right now. There you go. I brought it to you. Peter, I'd like for you to comment on uh, <clears throat> the agricultural supply chain and how it's different from other uh, supply chains and the implications you see going on with world agriculture supply relative to potential for famine. innocent question that is arguably the darkest answer. Okay. Uh, agriculture is unique in that everything has to be done in the right order at the right time. Otherwise, the harvest is lost and you have to wait for the next planting season to begin. So if you have a disruption in automotive and you can't get spark plugs and they come in three weeks later, you just plug them in and you're good to go. You can't do that with ag. You have to have the finance to pay for the inputs. You have to have the fuel for the heavy machinery. You have to have the fertilizer and the pesticide and everything else at the right time. Um, we have very discrete concentrations of production for a lot of the stuff that matters, with fertilizer being the single most exposed. Um, three quarters of the world's phosphate for, uh, fertilizer, for example, comes from either Saskatchewan or Belarus and a single mine in Russia. You can see the problem. So we're going to have a significant breakdown throughout the supply chain for any number of reasons that's going to cost us at least a billion people over the next 20 years. That assumes we are, are okay with GMOs. If we're not, two billion. Uh, there's not a way around that that I can see at the moment. And every day that we've gotten into the Ukraine war where that system hasn't broken is a gift because it provides a little bit more time for other producers to step in. So far, the two producers that have mattered the most are American chemical refiners who are cranking out as much nitrogen fertilizer as they can, and the Saskatchewanians, which is just a fun word, but um, they're, they're taking programs that were originally thinking to be 12 years for expansion, they managed to shrink it down to like seven or eight, every little bit. Thank you, Peter. For the grave dancers in the room, what's the play to exploit mainland China's demise? <laughs> uh, and real quick, why Atlanta and Detroit? Just a little follow-up question. Oh, just clearer targeting information and no missile defense but I didn't mean to suggest that those were the only two places that were in danger. Okay, uh, let me give you a, something not to do. Don't try to short sell the Chinese stock market. Uh, the, uh, every, every market before 1945, it typically went to zero at some point. Because uh, you can't short sell a country that fails. There's no one on the other side of that. So careful how you play. Uh, but in terms of betting on the future as opposed to trying to kick the Chinese world or down, it's all about the industrial position. There's a lot of plant that needs to be replaced. I tried to give you a quick look as to where some of the holes were. Uh, if I were betting on the biggest margin, let me give you two. Number one, those low quality chips, the Internet of Things, there's nothing about that technology that is, from our point of view, exotic and we could expand that very, very quickly. So it's not just for the Internet of Things, there's a lot of other uses for those low quality chips. For example, the average EV has $1,000 worth of them in it. Uh, and we could, we produce about 10% of the global total, Japan about 10%, China the rest. So filling that out is just a question of whether or not we're going to expend the relatively small amounts of capital and labor we have in order to build it out. But we know how to do that in less than two years, so that's the one. Uh, the next is medium manufacturing that's on the verge of heavy manufacturing. Because we have all the chemicals, it doesn't take much disruption for the rest of that to flood back. And anyone who gets in on that space before the break is going to have an outsized presence in the market for the remainder of at least a decade. 
Thank you. Sure. Follow-up investment question. Um, you've shown a lot of trends, and you feel they're pretty solid and concrete. I guess I would just ask, how is your own portfolio positioned in broad <laughs> terms? Um, and, and if it's not aligned with all that you're saying, why not? Uh, it is. Um, I am not a growth investor as a rule, my, just my own personal preference, because I don't have the time to de dedicate to it. I'm not a day trader in any stretch, of the, uh, ways, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and do not take this as financial advice, because that is not my job, uh, but what I do. I look for places that are American, where they, the company is American domiciled for rule of law, where the company has American production to take advantage of positive demographic trends, and if the end product is both energy intensive for its creation, because we have the cheapest energy in the world, and is something that could theoretically be exported, that's my list of things that I look for. Uh, at the top of my list is chemicals processing in the next step. Uh, next down is agricultural processing, because American farmers, not without exception, but with very few, they produce the raw stuff, and then they send it abroad. And we're missing out on a massive chunk of the value chain. And any company that has gotten into that has just made mad money. So, you know, a little plug for Iowa. Iowa is the highest value add agricultural sector on the planet because they produce the corn, they produce the soy, they produce the hogs, and then they turn them into something else before it gets to the end customer. And so they capture part of that value add. We're going to do that in energy, we're doing that in food, and that is where. I concentrate. That does not mean that there aren't other players here. The problem I personally run into in the manufacturing space is that a lot of this expansion is going to be small and mid-cap. I don't got time for that. There's just too many players. But someone who knows the space, it's probably an easy play. Peter, great, impactful uh, presentation, by the way. Really appreciate it. I, I was a manufacturer for 17 years. Woohoo! And, uh, and I moved it here to Tennessee. And one of the changes that we saw over the last, let's say, less than a decade, were a tax structure that actually discouraged mm. manufacturing here in the United States. Sure. Where we, at the end of the year, we'd count inventory and it would be a write-off because it was a, a liability. Yep. They changed it into an asset. During that time, 67,000 small manufacturers went out of business. I'd that love number to feels very low to me. Yeah, and, and you're probably right. And, and it, was, there, it was a certain sector. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So I mean, I, I would love for Congress and the U.S. government to be part of the solution here, but you know, one miracle at a time. <laughs> um, <sighs> so many ways I can go with this. The smart play is to get ahead of this. And by many metrics, we are. Industrial construction spending in the last six years is up by a factor of nine. And only about 40% of that is due to things that the Biden administration has done with like the CHIPS Act and the IRA. This, we had already gotten the jump on this before he ever came into office. Whether you want to credit Trump or China or whoever that, you know, whatever. Um, we're on the right path. We just need more and we need it sooner. The, the complaint, if I'm going to be that guy, that we have is we didn't start this a little bit sooner when capital was still cheap. And so now we're doing it in the teeth of a much different financial environment. Uh, as to your inventory concern, that is definitely something to hammer on with your legislators because as we move away from a just-in-time manufacturing model, we're going to have to move to a just-in-case one in the meantime. And that means building inventory at every stage of the supply chain system. Now, that will naturally push us towards a more constrained, fewer-step manufacturing model. But that does mean everyone will have to have more inventory. And if we penalize that while we're trying to build out, you can do the math for yourself as to what that means for your business. So the more unified the business community is on a few specific things, the better. And the uh, fiscal conservative me hates to say this, but you know, if you're going to suckle at the government teat, now is the time. Uh, because the investment capital that is going to need, uh, it's not clear that the private sector by itself can do it. There's going to be a lot of money coming in from capital flight, and the question is how do you capture that and redirect into something that's more productive than an empty apartment or a T-bill? And communities who can figure out how to do that are going to do better. Um, what the foreigners are after is rule of law, something that pays a dividend, 
or something that has a hard physical asset before it. And community development bonds like scratch two and a half of the three of those itches. So there are many ways that different communities, different states can play this. Uh, but everyone has to come up with their own solution. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'll pick one. Uh, so the, a lot of your predictions are based on the, the presumption that the U.S. is going to be largely abandoning the Bretton Woods system. Um, and can you expand a little bit more on what makes you think that, that we are going to wholesale abandon it rather sure. than just nipping around at the edges to, to sure. answer the call? Let me give populism. me two things. Uh, number one, in order for the Bretton Woods free trade, globalization, American-led order, whatever you want to call it, system to work, people need to be able to ship whatever they want, wherever they want, whenever they want. Uh, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, when we were in a Cold War confrontation, the other side didn't have much of a navy, and it wasn't in places that were important to commerce. So we had, I don't want to say a small navy by any stretch of the imagination, but our navy was right-sized for that task. It was designed in many ways for that task. In 1992, after the wall was down and the Soviet system collapsed, we retooled our navy to what we thought the new world was going to look like. Uh, instead of having a single massive power, that had to be confronted on dozens of points of contact. We thought that the future was just a handful of small annoying powers like North Korea and Iran, where the, the right approach was to have a handful of super carriers, concentrated fists of power that can smash. And we did away with most of our smaller frigate destroyer and cutter forces. The world we're in today is not that world. And we haven't had updated strategic guidance from the White House since 1992. And so the Navy has been continuing on this path towards more, bigger, fewer ships, even as the world has become much more dif differentiated. So we only have about 60 to 80 of the vessels that are capable of doing patrol. We probably need 800 to do the globe. And half of those ships are dedicated to protecting the carriers. So even if we wanted to right now, we can't provide global coverage. We can barely, barely patrol the Red Sea. And if we had like, a real issue with somebody who wasn't an incompetent terrorist somewhere else in the world, we couldn't do both at the same time. So I'd say strategically, we are no longer capable of supporting that system, even if we wanted to. As to whether we want to, Donald Trump basically left the WTO by not appointing judges so it can't function anymore, and Biden has neglected to do it. These are very, very similar presidents from that economic international point of view. And so the system that allows global trade to happen, the World Trade Organization, it functionally doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and then of course, when it comes to things like subsidies and policy, Biden is by far the most economically nationalist president we have ever had. This is fairly strongly bipartisan. They will bitch about who's on the letterhead, but the policies have a surprising resonance on both sides. Now, I personally think this is a bad idea but the guy that I've backed for president has lost every time since 1992. Thanks, Peter. Great presentation. Um, we EOers are entrepreneurs. You know, we're high risk, high reward, love capitalism, free markets. Can you give us an update on this guy, Malay, down in Argentina? Oh, he's a who, hoot. He's a hoot. Yeah. I mean, his, his presentation at World Economic Forum was like Ayn Rand right out of things. So what are the odds he pulls it off, libertarian capitalism. Will it be a success story? Okay, I would underline that we know as little about Malay today as we did about Donald Trump or Joe Biden in their first month on the job. He's never had a real job, he has no experience, he has some ideas in his head, and now he's trying to ram them through a legislator that is pathologically hostile to him. Very similar setups. Um, for him to be successful, he has to smash a political party that's the equivalent of the Democrats and the Republicans combined, while also destroying the Federal Reserve. That's a high bar. Now, that doesn't mean that I think he's gonna fail. I'm saying I don't know, because that, the old system is clearly broken in Argentina. Uh, but he clearly has not demonstrated the intellectual firepower creative creativity to come up with an alternative system. His idea is just to break it and step back and, you know, the world will take care of the rest. That may, in the case of Argentina, actually work. The natural resources are good, the educational system is good, the infrastructure is pretty good, and they're isolated from most security threats. But that's still a hell of a political shift, 
And in a country that has had famine in the last 25 years because of mismanagement, breaking everything at the same time strikes me as a bit of a reach. Because he's been very clear he doesn't have a plan for what's after. Because he doesn't think it's going to need one. And I'm like, mm, being a libertarian is great until the power goes out. And then all of a sudden you need a new plan and you're pathologically opposed to planning. I mean, that's why the libertarians never have succeeded here because they don't show up to meetings. <laughs> so I wish him well. I don't have high hopes. Peter, thank you. Love your work. Thanks. Question for you on the British economy oh in boy. a post-Brexit world, and specifically uh, your prediction for the future of the north of Ireland. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, let's start with Brexit. If you're like me and you think that the end of globalization and demographic aging means, among other things, the end of the European economic model, then there is something said for getting out before it collapses and starting on whatever's next. So when the Brits started kicking around this Brexit idea, I was like, I can see where that's coming from, and I can see that possibly working really well. But that assumption was based on the idea that after Brexit happened, they would actually get on with it. It has now been almost eight years, and the Brits still don't have a post-Brexit plan. And they've stopped talking about it. So until that happens, Britain is sliding ever further into economic dissolution and national chaos. And you know, it's been fun to watch. It's, like, it's just the nature of our relationship among the Anglo states. But it's not very productive. And with every day that passes, whatever leverage the Brits once had fades. And so there are basically two paths that they could have followed. Number one is you go out and you reach out to a number of countries that have good demographic structures in order to supplant the demand that used to go to Europe. You use your technology, you use your capital in order to service those markets, and you build up a trade relationship that's multifaceted. They have now aged like us past the point where that is a viable option, which leaves us with option two. You find a singular power with good demographics that is also a security partner, and you just dump everything into that market. That's a free trade agreement with the United States, or in the eyes of Justin Trudeau, like the one bright thought he's had, you come into NAFTA. The problem with that is you have to do it on America's terms, or if you join NAFTA, also on Mexico's and also on Canada's. You have to take the deal that's on the table. And the deal that the Trump administration put on the table was the financial centers in London closed down, all that business comes to New York. The manufacturing system is completely integrated into NAFTA norms, so among other things, that means that Airbus goes away. Uh, Airbus, by the way, for those of you who don't follow, is the, the Brits provide the engines and the wings. Reasonably important from my understanding. Uh, agriculture, you follow American phytosanitary norms, which means there's probably not a producer in Britain that would remain in business. If you don't do all three of those things by American preferences, there's no deal. So they left, being very pale. They went back, talked about it under the Boris Johnson government, and came to the conclusion that it was the only deal available. So they came back to accept the terms on January 6. <laughs> Needless to say, people were busy with other things that day. And that was the end of the Trump administration from a policy point of view. They then came back under Biden and discovered that the deal hadn't changed. In fact, it gotten a little worse. And they just haven't processed that it will never get better. So if you're a Brexiteer, you have to swallow the fact that not only were you wrong on everything, <laughs> you now have to submit yourself to your former colonies with a deal that is far worse than what you had with the EU. It's still the only game in town. They will eventually get there. But with every day that this is pushed, the terms get worse. As for Northern Ireland, that is a demographic question. Uh, the UK is aging less rapidly than the continent and less rapidly than Ireland. But Ireland is much younger. So there's this point where the demographics of the two countries are going to cross very soon which means that if something is going to happen to Northern Ireland, if it's going to reunify with the rest of the Republic of Ireland, it has to happen soon. Otherwise, the numbers in Ireland will collapse. And that date is within 10 years now. Maybe, maybe, maybe 15. 
Um, but if it's going to happen, it's going to happen soon. I don't know if it's going to happen. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Peter. Thanks for your time. Um, I'm a baby boomer, by the way, so I love you anyway. Just want to let you know. Um, you know, you've heard it said desperate people do desperate things in desperate times. Sure. With the background of China and then Taiwan, and we've heard, obviously, their reunification efforts to get Taiwan back. Pretty profound implications. What do you think, perhaps, sure. the timing of that is relative to their desperation? Okay. Or Let me give you the punchline. I don't know if there's going to be a Taiwan war. I understand why people are concerned about it, but um, a couple things to keep in mind. Um, number one, if Russia succeeds in the Ukraine war, it gets them a big step closer to actually addressing some of their long-term demographic and especially strategic problems. There's a logic to the war. There's nothing like that with Taiwan. If, if a war for Taiwan was launched, even if they capture the island intact, they can't operate the semiconductor facilities because they can't operate their own. And this is a country that imports 80% of their energy needs, 80% of the products that allow them to grow their own food, and they're the world's largest food export, or importer. So you put a few destroyers in the Indian Ocean Basin in the event of a war to cut the supply lines, and China goes into industrial and agricultural collapse in under six months, and you'll have 100 million dead people from famine within a year. And Xi knew that five years ago. For the last five years, though, no one's been telling him other, anything other than the propaganda. So I don't know about the decision-making process. Lots of folks say that if there's going to be a war, it has to happen on a certain timetable, but the way the war goes in the Taiwan Strait isn't the limiting factor here. It's China's ability to secure supply lines that go to other continents and then accessing the materials and the consumers of those continents. That's not a military question. That's a political question. And one of the things that we've seen in the last year is that pretty much everyone in the advanced world now is at a minimum distrustful of Beijing's intentions. The, uh, the reason to expect there might be a war, because strategically, demographically, economically, it's a horrible idea for the Chinese. The reason to still expect one is if you take the long view of Chinese history. Remember I mentioned this is going to be the 28th civilizational collapse. If I were a betting man, there will be a 29th opportunity. And so the question is, what does this next system look like after the CCC breaks the system and goes into whatever's next? Well, never in any of those 28 has the governing system of the old regime been the governing system of the new regime. If Xi can choose the time and the place of the war, even knowing it will trigger the end, because he believes, or understood five years ago, that the end was coming anyway, then if you can write the narrative, maybe your governing structure can survive to whatever's next for the low, low cost of the lives of half of your citizenry. That's a really dark thought process to get there, but that's the only reason that I can see that they would consciously choose a war. You guys are asking all the happy questions. Uh, I've been told by the muscle that I'm the last question, by the way. Oh, boy. Um, what is the biggest delta in what you know and what we see in the media? I'm not sure I follow. In, in, what, uh, in what popular media shows us, what's the biggest difference in, in that in general and what you know? Oh, well... The quality of international journalism has cratered over the last 25 years. So just awareness is kind of an achievement from my point of view. Um, Americans aren't happy unless they're stressed about something. In fact, let me, let me, let me show you this one last slide, because this, this is the single biggest thing to worry about. This is the cartel map. The blue is the Jalisco New Generation. They're the freaky, scary people. The orange is the Sinaloa. They're the ones who sell most of you your cocaine. And the, uh, the green are the Zetas who kind of imploded. You'll notice there's a lot of hashes. There's a gang war going on across all of Mexico right now. And the problem is the 
I guess I'm back over here. The problem's the blue. Uh, Sinaloa, the orange, they're the business-minded oriented. Like if a Korean chable was to run the drug industry, that would be their approach. It's a business. You don't rob old ladies, you don't shoot cops. You sell drugs, that's your, that's your job. The blue is like the first thing you do when you go into town is you shoot the cop that's at the top of the heap in his office in the police station so everyone knows you're there. And then you sell drugs. There's a fight between these two with the blue, Jalisco New Generation, cop shooters, ascendant. What they lack is control of the United States. If they get control of a plaza and they spill north, they will interact with the United States in a way that Sinaloa did not. Sinaloa doesn't shit where it sleeps. And so they don't shoot Americans. Jalisco would shoot Americans just cuz. And so if you start seeing white chicks named Debbie and Phoenix getting shot by drug pins, kingpins, that probably means that Jalisco has penetrated the border. And then we will have a very different conversation in this country about Mexico, about the border, about drugs, about trade. Now, there's no guarantee that's gonna happen. The guy who's in charge of Jalisco New Generation, guy by the name of El Mencho, is a bit of a psychopath. He runs a Trump-style organization where it's just him and then everyone else. And if he were to slip in the shower and fall on some bullets tomorrow, this goes away. But he hasn't slipped yet. I'm not sure that answers any of your question. What I'm saying is this is arguably the greatest threat to everything else that's out there right now. And how many of you had even heard of Jalisco New Generation before two minutes ago? Who else do you like in Latin America, though? I'm sorry? Who else do you like, favor in Latin America to kind of figure this out? Oh, well, I mean, I, Mexico's gonna stumble through one way or the other, mostly because the infrastructure is already in place and the education of the population for their level of development is great. Uh, the next country to watch is probably Colombia. Uh, second best with infrastructure, second best with population skills, and Mexico is now advanced to the point that they need an offshore, low-cost manufacturing partner. Mexico today needs a Mexico of the 1990s, and Colombia is the best bet. And we already have a free trade deal with them, so you know the hard work is already done. You can thank um, W for that one. <laughs>